It was the world's first specialized gun, created for the upper class and designed to shoot birds for sport. But its reputation for reliability and durability led to much greater roles. Hunter, protector, and warrior. For more than four centuries, if a man could afford to own just one weapon, he chose the shotgun. On the frontier, or the battlefield, it was one of the most frightening sounds ever heard. It's machinery in motion, and it's the machinery of death in motion, and uh, it sounds like nothing else. Powerful enough to strike fear into the bravest soldier, or the meanest outlaw. No one's gonna walk into a darkened room knowing that that clatch clatch is in there. That's because those facing the barrel end of a shotgun knew what was coming next. Ease of use and versatility are the qualities that made the shotgun popular. But the ability to fire a lethal spray of ammunition with a single pull of the trigger made it legendary. America's earlier settlers used shotguns to carve out a life in the New World. Outlaws used them to rob their way across the western frontier. Soldiers carried them in the trenches on the western front. And today, almost every American police car is equipped with a shotgun. No other type of firearm can boast such wide-ranging and long-standing acceptance. Handheld, smooth-bore guns first appeared in Europe during the early 14th century. But these tended to be either large, unwieldy muskets or small, cannon-like weapons. Most were ineffective against anything other than a stationary target. Give fire! Sometime in the early 15th century, Europe's aristocracy discovered sport shooting. At the time, hunting small game with trained falcons was highly popular in royal circles. Some say that a French nobleman found a novel use for his gun, quite by accident. Probably somebody was out with their falcons, and they said, well, I might as well take along my, my gun too, you know, and the falcon didn't fly that day, it was sick or something, and, and the duck flew, or the pheasant or whatever, the grouse or whatever, and the guy shot and the, the game fell down and he said, wait a second, I don't even have to chase the falcon to get it back, you know, this is really good. But bringing down a bird in flight with a ball fired by an early musket was largely a matter of luck. Hunters found a way to increase their chances in the cannon of the day. The big guns were often loaded with small lead balls, which, after being fired, spread out in a wide pattern. The same principle worked with muskets. Noblemen began experimenting with different quantities of small pellets, known as shot. When the musket proved awkward for quick aiming, gunmakers produced longer, lighter guns, which allowed for more maneuverability. These weapons, designed to fire shot only, were called Fowlers. These early shotguns were the first handheld firearms made for a specific purpose. This was used for one purpose and one purpose alone, which was to shoot birds. This is a bird hunting gun. Yes, you could use it for rabbits and you could use it for other small game, but it was specifically made as a fowling piece. 
Fowling guns and the sport of shooting were introduced to England in 1660 by King Charles II. When he returned from exile in France after England's civil war, Charles brought along his new passion. Noblemen in both Great Britain and the continent used to vie with each other. This was the sport of noblemen and the sport of kings was to shoot a flying animal out of the air with a lot of pellets that came from the smoothbore of a shotgun. There were books written on the subject. I believe the earliest one is dated 1728. It's called Terraplegia, or the art of shooting flying. One distinctive feature of the early Fowler was its long slender barrel which could measure up to six feet in length. Gun makers of the time believed this increased a gun's firing distance but Fowlers were meant to impress, as well as shoot. This is a typical example of a late 17th century fowling piece. This one happens to be English by Thomas Warnall, and it's got the typical decoration and form and, and the extremely long barrel of a fowling piece of that era. It has this lovely serpentine side plate, which is typical of guns from England and the continent and it has the lovely chiseling on the barrel. It's also chiseled on the front of the frizzen, as well as the hammer. The beauty and elegance of handcrafted fowlers was mirrored in the spectacular shooting parties, which became an important part of the social calendar. They had huge parties involving some tens of twenties of people and hundreds of beaters, as they called them, and uh, going through the bush and trying to uh, flush game out so these noblemen could shoot them while they were flying. Though created for the upper class, fowlers were soon available to the masses. They adapted less expensive versions, as well as other smooth bore guns, to fit their own more practical needs. The common people would use them to hunt for food for the family or to help uh, keep their livestock safe from marauding animals or defense in their home. Before long, variations of the Fowler began to appear. For instance, the blunderbuss was designed not for sport, but for self-protection and for war. They were loaded with pellets. And they were essentially the first sawn-off or riot shotgun, and they were commonly used on ships when they were in battle. They were required use on Her Majesty's naval vessels during the Napoleonic Wars and, and earlier because they were so effective against opponents that were in the topsails. In less than 50 years, the Fowler had outgrown its origins. Its small pellet ammunition had also inspired a new name, the shotgun. And although Europeans had perfected the weapon, it was in America that people came to trust their lives to the shotgun. The first British settlers in the New World found it filled with adventures, opportunities and unpredictable dangers. When the pilgrims arrived in 1620, the shotgun was an essential tool for survival. They were advised to bring shotguns because of their total practicality and the fact that America at the time was teeming with game. It was like a giant supermarket in terms of game and a shotgun was the most effective weapon for harvesting that game. Shotguns fascinated the Native Americans who were amazed by the pilgrims' ability to easily shoot birds out of the sky. They desired one of our men to shoot a crow complaining what damage they sustained in their corn by them. They much admired it, as other shots on other occasions. Edward Winslow, Plymouth, Massachusetts. Many of the early colonists were poor. They were escaping economic hardships in the old world and could rarely afford more than one weapon. The gun they owned had to be able to put food on the table. You do not necessarily want to go out and kill a deer every day. Uh, without refrigeration, you don't have a way to keep the meat, but you do need to feed your family every day. So the shotgun was the number one weapon that was used to take care of feeding their families. 
The shotguns favoured by the Americans in the 17th and 18th centuries were mostly large-caliber, single-barrel, muzzle-loading flintlocks. These multi-purpose guns could handle a variety of ammunition. One large-caliber ball was used for deer and other big game. Several medium-caliber shot for wild pigs and the like. Or a larger number of shot for birds and smaller game. Shotguns also provided protection. The deadly combination of a large swarm of shot and a heavy powder charge resulted in far greater damage than ball-firing muskets. If you are using a shotgun rather than a single projectile, you have a much better chance of, of, of hitting your target because you, you put out, uh, even at uh, 50 yards, a pretty good uh, pattern and, uh, and you don't have to be dead accurate. For those who relied upon shotguns for survival, several advancements helped increase their chances. In the late 1700s, improvements in both metallurgy and gunpowder gave birth to shorter and lighter guns. Gunmakers began to add a second barrel and trigger to the Fowler. The barrels could be fired simultaneously or one at a time. This is the design that will dominate shotguns through most of its history, and this is the most useful design in shotgun invention. Whether it be side by side or over and under, two barrels and two tube shotguns are going to pretty much dominate shotgun history. In 1806, Frenchman Joseph Manton patented the elevated sighting rib. This metal strip both strengthened the double-barreled guns and aided in their long-range accuracy. The elevated rib served as a perfect plane for which to sight and fire at a flying or moving bird. And this elevated rib combined with this little German silver front sight made this a very fine fouling piece indeed, although, as I say, well within the reach of anybody who had any sort of decent employment. Though single-barrel shotguns were widely used, the double barrel was preferred by America's frontiersmen. In the wilderness, two barrels almost always proved better than one. One of the advantages of a double-barrel shotgun especially in hostile country, is that you could load two barrels with different loads. One you might load for hunting small game, and the other you could keep ready with buck and ball or more powerful charge in case you were attacked, thus protecting yourself. Legendary Americans like Jim Bridger, Jedediah Smith, and James Beckworth are reported to have used shotguns. Well, the mountain man had, it was a wonderful character because he was totally free and he, and he bet on his own wits. You always hear of the rifles and that was very important to shoot buffalo or grizzly bears or things like that. But probably the gun that was always around the saddle horn, hanging off the saddle horn of a mountain man's horse was his shotgun because that could be immediately used and uh, it could get him all kinds of game. And his, his first requirement was to eat. The double barrel shotgun was also well suited for short range defense. The ability to fire two tremendous blasts of ammunition made it far preferable to a single bullet or ball firing weapon. This police video demonstrates the shotgun's power. At 15 feet, the ammunition spray forms a tight pattern. As the distance is increased, the pellets spread out roughly one inch for every one yard travelled. The shotgun is most effective within 50 yards of a target. Many people have the mistaken belief that the moment it's fired, the shot is spread 
to a wide pattern. They, they see this in movies and they see walls being blown apart and so on. That's not necessarily the case. If you're too close, you're not going to get a large shot pattern. However, the opponent is going to be hit with a heck of a wallop of shot. By the late 1830s, Casimir Lefaucheur, a Frenchman, had revolutionized the shotgun. He combined a break-open shotgun design with ammunition-filled cartridges. The barrel separated from the stock by pivoting on an underhinge near the trigger. Ammunition was then inserted at the breech. The shotgun's most celebrated period came during the settling of America's Wild West. From the 1860s through the 1890s, from St. Louis to San Francisco, it seemed as if everyone carried a double-barrel shotgun. Immigrants, farmers, ranchers, lawmen, outlaws, military men, Indians, you name it. Just about everybody of some sort would use a shotgun if they could get one. It was the most versatile weapon. If you only had one gun and you had to go west, you would be best served with a double-barreled shotgun. Like many of their forefathers, western settlers were often poor and could only afford one gun. The shotgun served as both protector and hunter. Many immigrants traveled west with a shotgun stashed behind the seat of their covered wagon. It was much easier to handle than a rifle. This was essential for families where a weapon was used by men, women and children. Anybody who fires guns will tell you that it's very, very hard to hit, very easy to miss. But if you have a shotgun, it's much easier to hit because you have a pattern of, of lead flying through the air. And so, so it becomes an excellent choice for a weapon for someone that doesn't have time to train, doesn't have time to practice. The shotgun's durability was also crucial. Its hollow tube was easier to clean and maintain than the groove barrels found in a pistol or rifle. Also, its relatively simple mechanism meant most breakdowns could be fixed on the spot without the need of a gunsmith. Simplicity and economics and the ability to hit well without a lot of practice all make the shotgun an extremely good, good firearm. And it's the best firearm ever made for hunting game, uh, small game and birds. But on the lawless frontier, the need for protection was often as important as eating. In boom towns and cow towns across the West, gold and currency were transported on special money wagons or stage coaches. Shotguns were the primary weapons used to safeguard these shipments. Riding shotgun meant more than just sitting in the front seat. This is an example of a historical old coach gun. Double barreled, exposed hammers, and these were usually 10 gauge or 12 gauge shotguns. And they were cut down, sawed off, short barrel. Some sawn off shotguns had barrels cut as short as nine inches. This increased the recoil effect or kick, but made the guns much more maneuverable. A sawed-off shotgun was much more preferable to a long-barreled shotgun, as you can see here. Uh, just the easiness to wield these things around, uh, it's much easier to wield a sawed-off shotgun around. Matter of fact, one stagecoach driver said that when bouncing on a coach and being pursued by road agents, it was a lot easier to turn and get off relatively accurate shots with a short-barreled shotgun as opposed to moving around one of these big long toms. Stagecoach drivers often faced the other end of the barrel. Highway bandits and train robbers also favored the shotgun. The notorious Black Bart, whose exploits were immortalized in early Hollywood, held up over 20 stagecoaches with a shotgun. Black Bart said that he had never had his shotgun loaded and probably wouldn't even work. But he knew that it had the intimidation factor, that when he leveled that shotgun at a stagecoach driver, that uh, they were going to listen to him and transact the business at hand. 
Lawmen like Wild Bill Hickok, Wyatt Earp, and Bat Masterson used double-barreled shotguns. When the cattle drives ended and the cowboys went wild, it was the lawman's job to keep the peace. What was great about the shotgun was that if you had to deal with crowds, if you had to deal with people who were coming in, in numbers, there was no question in the minds of the people you were facing that you were not going to miss. And that was critical. Contrary to Hollywood lore, in real Old West shootouts, the shotgun proved far superior to the more celebrated rifle. If you're a police officer and you know there's trouble and you're expecting problems, the first thing you do is go into your office, get the shotgun, and head back out on the streets. You then could hide behind a building or take cover, and you could take aim from behind a building towards people moving. And when people are moving, the shotgun is much more effective in a, in a battle than, than a single projectile out of a rifle. Bill Doolin, a member of the infamous Doolin Dalton gang, learned of the shotgun's power the hard way. After escaping from jail, Doolin was chased down and killed in a shootout with a sheriff's posse. In the most famous shootout of all, the gunfight at the OK Corral, the shotgun demonstrated its power over pistols. The men facing each other carried heavy caliber revolvers, but Doc Holliday also wielded a shotgun. During the 30-second shootout, roughly 30 shots were fired, including a double-barrel blast from the shotgun. Now, ironically, while the pistols that were used were heavy-caliber pistols and were very effective, many of the men shot there were still able to get off follow-up shots afterwards, despite being mortally wounded. But this shotgun uh, blast that uh, Holiday fired was just effective. You got three men that were killed and three men that were wounded, and it took 30 shots. On the other hand, with the shotgun, they didn't have any missiles at all. So of all of the shots in the gunfight at the OK Corral, the most effective shots came out of a shotgun. They were the ones that didn't miss. The shotgun later earned a permanent place in Western folklore through Buffalo Bill's Wild West shows. Sharpshooters like Annie Oakley and Johnny Baker thrilled worldwide audiences with their amazing ability to shoot glass balls thrown into the air. While the double-barrel shotgun dominated the 19th century, gun designers continually sought ways to increase its power. The revolving shotgun has been in existence since the late 1700s. It could fire five rounds before reloading, but was much more expensive than the double barrels and never caught on. In 1882, Christopher Spencer, along with Sylvester Roper, created the first pump or slide action shotgun. Their revolutionary design failed, but fathered many imitators. A decade later, legendary gun designer John Browning helped usher in a new era for the shotgun. Browning's six-shot Winchester Model 1887 became the first commercially successful repeating shotgun. This was a shotgun that had a lever action not unlike the Winchester rifles. And when you loaded the shotgun, you made the lever engage and you loaded very quickly. So this allowed you to carry a shotgun that was very much like a rifle in the fact that you could shoot multiple times and still have the effectiveness of the shotgun when it, when it leaves the muzzle, when it uh, shoots. It was combining the best properties of a rifle and the best properties of a shotgun. Browning repeated his success with the six-shot Winchester pump action, first the model 1893 and later the 1897. Lawmen across America fell in love with its power. So did a legion of outlaws, from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in the 1880s 
to Bonnie and Clyde in the 1930s. For one thing, this shotgun has a distinctive sound. Uh, this shotgun is, is, a, is, a, is a weapon that every outlaw and every burglar knows because as soon as that shotgun is, is ready to, made ready to fire, it makes a sound that is distinctive and it's very, very efficient, very, very quick and you can fire, you know, five, six shots very, very rapidly. It's a sound like none other. It's been popularized on television and movies for decades now, and uh, it sounds like nothing else. There was a story of a man that uh, got, into, uh, got into an altercation with another man, and, and the first fellow said, don't mess with me, I'm a master at karate. And the other fellow said, I'm a master at kachuk. And he said, what's that? And he pulled out a shotgun and went, kachuk. And that ended the fight right there. <laughs> the pump action was the shape of the future. In the 20th century, the shotgun would continue to flourish. From its origins as a plaything for European royalty, the shotgun emerged as an essential tool for the common man on the American frontier. Through the centuries, it also gained a fearsome reputation as a military weapon. During the American Revolution, General George Washington encouraged his troops to load their muskets with one lead ball along with several small shot pellets. This combination, known as buck and ball, increased firepower as well as the chances of hitting the enemy. General Washington was a proponent of the use of buck and ball in the muskets because uh, in, in close fighting, this would give his troops a real advantage over the enemy. The devastation caused by ball, round ball, and small buckshot pellets could be very, very effective uh, fighting against a, a force of British soldiers coming at them. Buck and ball became standard issue during the Seminole Indian Wars in Florida between 1815 and 1825. The musket's shotgun-like potency proved extremely effective in Florida's thick swamps. The shotgun's first wide use in a military role came with the American Civil War. Early in the war, volunteer units on both sides carried their own shotguns brought from home. Later, as ordnance improved, most troops were issued single-shot and repeating rifles, which were much more effective against targets at distances greater than 50 yards. But the shotgun remained a popular weapon, especially with Confederate cavalry units who used double-barrel percussion shotguns with devastating effectiveness. The Confederate cavalry often fought in hit-and-run tactics, ride in, fire fast, and get out. And a fast-moving force like that that fought close quarters would find a shotgun a very valuable weapon. Many times a heated battle might leave a shotgun dented or bent. The rebels simply shortened the barrels, making the weapon more maneuverable during fights. In these cavalry confrontations, they just bested the Union cavalry time and time again because they're going to hit what they shot at, and when they hit something, it was going to get knocked down. Confederate cavalry general Nathan Bedford Forrest championed the shotgun, often carrying two doubles into a fight. Although the South lost the war, Forrest never tasted defeat on the battlefield. After the war, the shotgun once again became a civilian weapon, but with the introduction of repeating shotguns, the US Army began using them in specialized roles. During an uprising in the Philippines in the early 1900s, Captain John Blackjack Pershing's troops used shotguns against the Moro nationals. The Moros would get themselves, you know, bound up, and take all kinds of drugs, and 
do what they called run huramentado, which meant crazy, and they would uh, they would hack, you know, even if they were shot with a crag rifle or something, they had these big knives and stuff, and they would hack up whoever shot them and before they died, and they were very difficult to, to stop. And the only thing that would stop them flat out was that 97 shotgun, so that became very popular among troops. When the U.S. entered the First World War, Black Jack Pershing became commanding general of the American Expeditionary Forces. At his request, the Army issued a limited number of bayonet-equipped pump-action shotguns to the Doughboys fighting in the trenches. These so-called trench guns saw action on night patrol duty, guard duty, and especially on raids into enemy territory. Once again, the shotgun proved itself a superior close-range weapon. They were used whenever anybody was lucky enough to get one issued to them as opposed to a bolt-action 3006 Springfield, which is a fine weapon at two or three hundred yards, but an almost useless weapon at ten or twenty. The Germans detested them, they didn't use them, they regarded them as barbaric. In Europe, the shotgun had remained primarily a sporting gun. To the uninitiated, its effect in combat was shocking. The German government denounced the pump-action shotgun and unsuccessfully petitioned the international courts in an attempt to outlaw their use in warfare. And the Germans screamed murder. You know, they were using poison gas and, and gagging people to death and all forms of artillery all this kind of thing, but when we came with our 97 shotguns, they said, this is against the, you know, the laws of decency. No country club or millionaire shooting line. During the Second World War, the shotgun was again called into action. British and American aerial machine gunners trained by shooting at clay pigeons with shotguns from the back of trucks. Thus, they learned how to lead a flying target while moving themselves. But the shotgun also served in combat. Though its use was limited in Europe, it proved invaluable to marines in the jungles of the South Pacific. Where well, you're fighting in close quarters, you have a very short visibility. Generally, the enemy is closer. Officers and uh, men with shotguns found themselves uh, shooting point-blank range many times at the enemy and a shotgun is a perfect weapon for that because you can cycle your ammunition through there fast and you're getting a good dispersal of firepower in a real hurry in a short range. A shotgun is the most devastating short-range weapon that isn't going to kill you as well. It has been true since the shotgun was created. It's preferable to a submachine gun or anything else in terms of close-range defense. Since the Second World War, military shotguns have undergone a dramatic transformation. While the pump action is still in widespread use, counter-terrorist agencies and specialized military units now use semi-automatic and even fully automatic shotguns. Ammunition has changed as well. Lead pellets have given way to rifled slugs, gas rounds and even beanbag rounds. The shotgun's success in the battlefield paralleled its popularity in the private sector. Throughout the 20th century, the shotgun has appealed to a diverse cross-section of society, from Hollywood stars to bootleggers and bank robbers. The 1920s and 30s saw notorious American gangsters like Al Capone, John Dillinger, and Machine Gun Kelly carrying a wide range of powerful weapons, including shotguns. Whippet guns were small and easily concealable, similar to Sonoff shotguns. The Remington Model 11 was a prime example. It was very popular with burglars and very popular with criminals in general. A sawed-off shotgun was certainly the weapon of choice, I mean, even over a machine gun. Another weapon of choice was the automatic shotgun. It was fast, accurate, and extremely powerful, 
capable of discharging six rounds in three seconds. John Browning created the first commercially successful version in 1903. Browning considered it one of his greatest achievements. Something about just the way it works, and, the, and the, you, know, you look at it, and you say, how did he ever think this up, this, the, the simple genius of it? You know, that the recoil pushes the barrel back, and there's like a shock absorber, so it takes up the recoil itself against the shoulder. The barrel goes back, picks up the shell so perfectly, loads it, ejects the other shell. Socially, it was a devastating gun used by you know, lawmen and gangsters alike. Bonnie Parker used one of those, and she was quite dangerous. To defeat the gangsters, the police had to increase their own firepower. Pump-action shotguns were a crucial addition to the arsenal. Today, the shotgun remains standard issue for police departments across America. It is also the weapon used for crowd control and crime fighting in densely populated areas. You take an automatic rifle or even auto, an automatic pistol, uh, if a round uh, either goes through an assailant or misses entirely, that thing can travel on for quite a ways. With a limited range of a shotgun, you have more control over not only rapid firepower, but your deadly firepower is more controllable because it's not going to go as far and you're going to keep it within the area of combat. This is your contemporary modern police uh, shotgun used for controlling riots. The hammer is inside the, the weapon so you can cock the weapon. It's very smooth action. You can fire the weapon, you can cock it again. The Ithaca Model 37 is designed for law enforcement. It has no disconnect so that if you wish, you can simply keep your finger on the trigger and the gun will continue to fire each time the slide is pumped. But for its wide uses, the shotgun remains at its core what it has always been, a sporting gun. Skeet and trap shooting have long been popular with people from all walks of life. Hollywood's golden years saw stars such as Clark Gable, Marlene Dietrich and Bing Crosby spending time on shooting ranges. Robert Stack was a world champion shot as a teenager. At sporting clubs and shooting ranges today, a new generation of celebrities like Tom Cruise, Steven Spielberg and Tom Selleck often mingle with stockbrokers, writers and truckers. We call this uh, redneck golf, you know, and it, and it really does the same thing that golf or tennis do or something. It's a catharsis, you know, you, you get out there and you shoot and you kind of forget you yourself and everything and it's sort of zen. It's very zen, you know, you sort of imagine the target exploding, you don't even hear the gun go off, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's just a good, it's, and it's great fellowship, you know, we, we're not real... Uh, rifle shooters or pistol shooters here, we're mostly shotgun shooters. For those more serious about shooting, there is competition at every level for both men and women. Medals are awarded at the Olympic Games in three shotgun related sports, skeet, trap and double trap. 17 year old Randy Sotoa is a member of the US Junior Olympic skeet shooting team. Randy's interest in the sport surprised many of his high school friends. First they were kind of like, whoa, you use guns and all that kind of stuff, but uh, they've, they've gotten really used to it and they think it's pretty cool and a lot of them want to come out and try it and they think it's a pretty interesting sport. I mean, no one really else does that, so they don't know what to expect. Through shooting, Randy has learned lessons for life. I've earned a lot of discipline and uh, I've learned to focus. Like when I have a job, I'll, I'll be more stick to it kind of thing. The shotgun has come full circle since its days as a royal fowler that peaked in the late 1800s. 
Legendary British gunmakers such as Purdy, Boss, and Holland and Holland handcrafted guns that were as much works of art as tools for sport. They had figured out something that was very esoteric, which was that they had brought the gun down to where it became part of of your body. And you really didn't think of all of looking down the barrels. You simply looked at the target and the gun swung perfectly and moved perfectly and you just fired it at your will. So it was really your mind willing that bird to fall out of the sky. And when you're shooting really well with one of those guns, it's almost like that. You just simply say, that one. And it's almost like you point, it falls out of the sky with your finger. You're not even aware of shooting the gun. Okay, Lucio. Today, the most magnificent shotguns are again made in Europe and are valued for both their form and function. Italy is now in the forefront of quality and artistry because they have the finest engravers, Torcoli, Fricassi, and they have the great gun makers, Fabri, Parazzi, and Beretta. This is a Rizzini. A gun like this is uh, an extraordinary work of art as well as an extremely functional gun. But our 18th century or 17th century wildfowler would be very much at home using this because it hasn't really changed that much in 400 years. Mauro Parazzi is a second generation gun maker from Italy. The tradition that is our mark, our emblem, was founded by my father about 40 years ago. The result is a combination of tradition with enough new and recent. And obviously we are the ones who have searched to achieve that which has been learned in the past to bring into the present, and therefore to carry it into the future. Yeah, yeah. Parazzi's customers can choose from a wide variety of types and styles. The guns are then custom fit to the buyer's size and adjusted to his shooting habits. The shotgun I'm showing now, I believe, remains my favorite shotgun. My favorite for several reasons. Overall, is the fact of the engravings, which are very detailed, created by a 25-year-old woman. We have portraits of women, we have felines in the foreground, and we have very detailed birds. The time taken to make these engravings was about seven, eight months, including the sketches. The rendering of which took about three months. It's obviously a very particular hunting rifle. This was built for hunting, but I believe it's more for a collector. Those with the inclination and the money can spend more than $100,000 for a shotgun. This is a Fabry. This is a 20 gauge. It's smaller than a 12 gauge. Um, it's an upland gun. This is the best gun made today. This thing is made out of steels that are just so strong and so tough and everything on this gun fits perfectly. They're a cross between a, you know, a Stradivarius and the space shuttle. And they like to say that they'll make a gun that will last in use for a thousand years. Uh, because they say the Roman Empire lasted a thousand years, so why, why can't we make a gun that will last for a thousand years? Whether it's necessary to make a gun that lasts a thousand years is another question. You know, but why not try? Since its royal beginnings more than 400 years ago, the shotgun has become the people's choice because of its versatility, simplicity, and durability. From the New World, to the frontier towns of the American West, to the battlefields of Europe and Asia, the old saying has been proven time and again, if a man can afford to own just one weapon, he'll choose a shotgun.